So Misha Hubler is a civil engineer with specialization in structural engineering, currently holding the position of assistant professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental and Architectural Engineering at the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Hubler's research profile spans both theoretical analytical modeling and experimental investigation for predicting the performance of construction materials. With outstanding research contribu contributions in these areas, Dr. Hubler has had a key role in the Ryland TC242 MBC on multi-decade creep and shrinkage of concrete and is an active member of ACI 209 on creep and shrinkage of concrete and also of the ASCE Engineering Mechanics Division on Experimental Analysis and Instrumentation. Dr. Hubler currently guides a number of doctoral, postdoc, and master's research candidates, apart from being a prolific peer reviewer for journals and research grants, and she has patent applications to her credits as well. So congratulations already, and I'm really looking forward to hear your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, um, and thank you for this honor of giving this presentation today. Um, my research spans a number of topics. Currently, I'm actively working on bioengineering living cements and concrete, as well as the remediation of well cement. The other topic I'm uh, working on is new concrete construction methods, which are alternative to 3D printing, since we're facing a number of challenges in that area, as we just heard. But today I've, I've only picked one topic and this actually is because it's my passion. Um, I, I really enjoy studying the modeling of long-term deformations of concrete. And what I mean by long-term is specifically the creep, the shrinkage, and more recently also the cracking. Okay, so to motivate my work, I'll start with uh, section one here, discussing um, efforts to improve creep and shrinkage models that were done a number of years ago. Um, the motivation for improved creep and shrinkage models stems from uh, our objective to achieve improved environmental and economic sustainability for concrete. This effort drives two things. The first thing is um, concrete infrastructure lifetimes. So to push beyond 50 to 100 years for concrete infrastructure lifetime, um, we need to be able to better predict the time dependent creep and shrinkage behavior of concrete. So here I've collected some images of structures that are particularly susceptible to these long-term deformations either due to the mechanical loading, in that case the creep, or the environmental loading, in that case the shrinkage. The second thing that this um, objective drives is the development of sustainable concrete. In order to be able to make a better concrete, we have to know material design objectives. So what do we actually have to design in our concrete materials in order to achieve better time-dependent behavior? And so these are two very exciting topics. Okay, the key challenge to developing long-term predictions for creep and shrinkage of concrete is that we can't really do 100 years of testing. Long-term testing right now is usually around however long a, a graduate student might be part of a research group. So that's about three or four years. Um, and so we need to extrapolate from those data in order to push the lifetimes of concrete and new concretes that are developed. The second challenge is that there are many correlated mechanisms that impact creep and shrinkage, not just moisture movement as well as the mechanical loading, and these all have an integrated role in our prediction. The last point is a large scatter in the data. So here I have selected for a narrow range of concrete compositions, some data from a data set for basic creep, so that's an environmental isolation. If we look at the response to the loading, and you see this large amount of scatter of the compliance of the material as a function of logarithmic time. And I've superimposed two existing models that are making an attempt to make sense of this type of data. The same is seen for the total shrinkage behavior. We have so much enhanced scatter in our data that the variability in our functional form is much less. So the only way we can work with this type of data is if we augment our experiments with theory that will allow us to subset our data and make better prediction models. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about theories out there. Many theories are based on rheological models for the concrete cross-sectional behavior. Here I have illustrated an example compliance function. The shape of the compliance function uh, varies with the time of loading, and we can plot in terms of the time, the age of the concrete, as well as the logarithmic age of the concrete. To model this type of compliance behavior, we can use a sequence of rheological components to capture the instantaneous deformation, the solidification and aging, the flow of the material, as well as the also environmentally impacted shrinkage and thermal expansion. One thing that is not explicitly captured in most models these days is in fact the cracking of the material. As an example here, when we're working on the development of the B4 model, the sequence of calibrating one of these models to develop a prediction function starts with the composition. Let's see here, move this. The composition of the preparation of concrete, such as the water symmetry ratio, the aggregate content, the cement type, and the strength. So, with these few variables um, and a whole bunch of experimental data, we try to estimate about 25 model parameters that scale the mechanical functions from these rheological equations. This allows us to develop a predictive function that would hopefully work for all mixes of concrete that are related to the data set that we have. Now, one approach to improving this modeling process is to add more data. So for a few years back, as part of my PhD thesis, we added the long-term data from structures to our, our data set. The way we did this is on the left side here, you see the material compliance is, it is captured in the logarithmic time scale. That material compliance data will provide information about how the material deforms only in the short term, because these are from laboratory tests. Okay, and then the, from bridge deflections, we can get the long-term response of the data. And so here we have the deflection of a bridge, we can, which can relate to the long-term behavior of the a material. Now we can combine these two data sets very carefully. First, by creating weighted subsets of the data, depending on the input of the particular type of experiment or the field observation of the bridge. Then when we have the weighting of the data with respect to its input, values, we can create a combined objective function, minimizing the error between the data and our prediction equation, both for the shrinkage and the creep. There are multiple ways that we can minimize this objective function. One of them is in terms of optimization or machine learning or learning types of approaches. The only real difference between optimization and learning is whether or not we incorporate the uncertainty in our prediction process. Okay, so for optimization, we could use, for example, a gradient-based optimization of weighted least squares residuals, or we could use a Bayesian introduction of the grid data into the already fitted material test model. What we found is that both approaches give approximately the same solution. Either way, we arrive at a better fit for both selected short-term data from the laboratory, as well as overall fit for the entire database of data that we have available. On the left side here, we see the coefficient of variation of various existing models at the time, as well as this B4 model that shows now a lower coefficient of variation with respect to the short-term laboratory creep data. On the right side, we also see here now for the combination of the laboratory creep data as well as the bridge data, a reduced coefficient of variation. Now at this point, the question is, is this good? Are we done? And based on what we've seen over the years and the fact that these models are all have uh, years or digits assigned to them, we get the idea that this is an ongoing development process. So a question would be, why do these models keep being updated? The general idea is this, we can feed all the data we have to the most advanced optimization or learning algorithms while using functions that only partially play a role in our solution objective. And then we will never really converge to a single solution. We can always add more data or slightly improve our solution of uh, our functions that play a role. And always we will get a slightly better prediction equation. In other fields, if we try to learn from other materials, 
what we find is that they can actually use concepts like machine learning to experimentally optimize the materials for particular performance. They actually use concepts such as statistical physics models for materials, and then they can converge to a solution. However, these types of problems are limited to typically two-phase systems that are relatively homogeneous. So the challenge is if we want to do something similar for concrete, we need actually a Hamiltonian that is able to describe a random multi-phase material. So this is actually what is lacking both in these prediction equations and to allow us to enable to use other optimizations or learning methods to develop our concrete materials. If we consider the example of the last few slides, the limitation we're actually facing is by applying our optimization or learning algorithms is that we lack the most energetically correct descriptor that would link the state of our concrete to the behavior that we are trying to predict. Okay, so for the rest of this talk, I've taken some small steps in an effort to improve or change our perspective on how we model creep and shrinkage. And so first I would like to talk about, let's take a look at these cracks, the cracks that we aren't explicitly modeling. How much of a source of the scatter is coming from these cracks and how might we introduce the effect of the cracking on both drying shrinkage and creep? And secondly, can we assess one physics-based model for creep? There have been multiple efforts for numerical modeling insights onto creep and shrinkage behaviors. And let's see what we could make with use of one of those uh, for macro scale behavior. Okay, so first here now in section two, let's take a closer look at cracking. Okay, how do cracks affect drying shrinkage? Well, we can do an X-ray of a drying piece of cement. And what we observe is a crack network in the cement. And the interesting thing that we find if we do a series of these is that with increasing sample size, so going here from one centimeter to two centimeters to three centimeters, we have more cracked surfaces. Okay, so as we build a larger and larger structure, we can easily anticipate that there will be more cracks. The other thing that we find is that if we decrease the relative humidity, here going from somewhere 30% relative humidity to 16% relative humidity, we consistently see that we end up with a more branched network. There is not so much of an effect than the water cement ratio that is observed in our samples. We can take this type of data, the spatial data of our crack distributions, and we can introduce it into a moisture uh, diffusion model and check to see if the impact of cracks on the moisture movement is in fact related to the volume to surface ratio that is as it currently often captured in creep and shrinkage prediction models. And what we find on the case here on the left and in the plot the blue is that if there are no cracks then we can relate the magnitude of the moisture content at a certain time to the volume to surface ratio in a quite linear fashion. However, if we introduce these cracks now into our model, the only way that we can make the same relationship is if we not only consider the external surface area of our cement sample, but also the additional surface area introduced by our cracks. So the first point here is that in order to correctly capture the effect of the cracks, we need to somehow capture the surface of being added due to these cracks, which act as highways for our moisture to enter our sample. Moving on, we'd like to now relate the drying shrinkage to this moisture content. However, if I create the plot here on the left, looking at the magnitude of the shrinkage at a certain time as a function of the moisture content, we find that there is a poor trend relating these two. There's something missing. And what is missing here is the mechanics. Technically, there is a statistical size effect that affects this problem because each crack, shrinkage crack, must start on the surface of the sample because of the gradient of the properties and the moisture that we see. In order for that crack to open, it will find a flaw, and at that flaw, we'll then start to initiate the cracking. 
The statistical size effect associated with the surface flaws follows a Weibull distribution. It has previously been proposed by Bajant and Plas that microcracking reduces the shrinkage strain magnitude. So here this equation on the right shows the cracking strain should be the shrinkage strain without cracks minus the impact of the microcracking here. So now if we introduce the viable distribution for a size effect with this tensile strength in here in the impact of the microcracking, we find that our drying shrinkage plot data can collapse onto a plot in terms of the size of the specimen. And here what we've done is we've superimposed the results of our diffusion models using the X-ray data on top of DIC measurements or digital image correlation measurements. We have taken a bulk shrinkage cement test. So our proposition is that in fact, the, uh, the proposed formulation for the strain and the introduction of the cracked surface area should be in terms of this composite function one, to capture the effects of diffusion that has the volume of the surface of the outside of the sample plus the surfaces of the cracks in the denominator, as well as second function that contains the strain due to the cracking that should be a function of the outside surface area coming from this surface size effect uh, distribution. Now, let's not forget that in reality, the concrete is largely made of aggregate. Um, and so now that we've studied our cement, we can introduce the effect of aggregate by using an existing model for the mechanics such as Pickett's model. Now, if we add 20% by volume aggregate or 50% by volume aggregate, you see that this dark line, which represents the magnitude of the shrinkage as a function of the size, becomes reduced. So the aggregate helps us to resist this shrinking of our material with its stiff inclusions. And so if we adjust the stiffness of the aggregate, we see this effect is increasing. So our conclusions here is that in fact, the aggregate can be used to control the size dependent impact of cracks on shrinkage. The important point to make generally from this study is that shrinkage in fact reduces with specimen size, However, the error, error of ignoring cracks increases with specimen size. And we saw earlier, the larger my sample gets, the more cracks I have. So this is something that should not be ignored. Now let's turn our attention to creep. What are the cracks doing to the creep? We can um, simulate the hydration of the cement. I initially tried to study this experimentally and found that the cracks that are in fact starting and impacting the creep are so small that it's hard to study this experimentally. So here we have a numerical model of the hydration process of an uncracked and a cracked piece of cement that's 100 micrometers for different water to cement ratios. We're considering a type 1, 2 type of cement and the initial mix is generated from image data using the VCCTL software. The hydration is simulated in thermal and chemical equilibrium using the Thames software. On the figure on the right, you can see the volume fraction of our calcium silica hydrate over time is increasing during the hydration process and the water content is decreasing, which is very satisfying telling us that in fact, this hydration process is working. Okay, so once we have hydrated our cement virtually, what we can do is we can now uh, make a mapping of our microstructure to a finite element model and assign unique voxel behavior to each one of our phases. In particular, the viscoelastic property of the calcium silica hydrate, um, which motivates or underlies the creep behavior of our cement is assigned. So here we have the relaxation modulus of the calcium silica hydrate with time. Now, if I conduct um, a relaxation test by imposing a unit strain on my combined sample, I can observe the evolution of the cement mechanical properties, both with and without a crack. Here I've plotted the Young's modulus with and without a crack. No crack is the solid line, the dashed line is with a crack. And the Poisson's ratio with and without a crack you notice the biggest effect on the Poisson's ratio happens at, for example, for a water cement ratio of 0.4 if I introduce this one crack. 
The twins are uh, cement structures, concrete structures are usually not 100 micrometers. We can now create a macroscopic material by taking this finite element model and assuming periodic boundary conditions. And now if we conduct our stress relaxation test, test on a 150 millimeter sample, we can apply a, a unit strain at one day, we see that our relaxation modulus over time evolves. And that in fact, we have a 5% difference in stresses after 25 days due to the appearance of micro cracks. And we assume that we always have some micro cracks in our cement. But this effect is on order of adjusting our water cement ratio from 0.4 to 0.45. If we now were to superimpose the cracks due to drying on top of these cracks, then we might end up with an even greater difference in our stresses that is being ignored due to the presence of the cracks. Okay, so let's move on to another topic. Now let's talk a little bit about creep and the uh, physical models that have been developing to describe creep and see if we can make sense of some of them. So recent analytical and numerical models show that discrete elements nicely capture the multi-scale mechanics of concrete. Now I have a number of references here. They also apply to the next point. The next point is that some molecular models of the calcium silicate hydrate and the cement reveal that the non-equilibrium state of the hydrate may be the nanoscale origin of the creep. Okay, so what is unique about discrete models and why they capture this multi-scale mechanics so well? Well, the thing that's different about discrete models is that they capture configurational information. This represents the mechanical Hamiltonian of the system. Or in other words, the concrete material structure itself is captured in this model. And when we load it, it can actually restructure, which something like a continuum or finite element model might not be able to do. So here I have a figure taken from someone else's work that shows an example of such a discrete model. Now this particular configuration of material seems random but it describes a possible material configuration for cement. In an energy landscape, it might represent this black point here. Now, that black point, if it is truly not in the lowest equilibrium state, we could input additional energy to move this state to another local minima or the global minima. This should change the long-term behavior of the material. So if these molecular numerical models are correct, we should be able to test this on the macro scale experimentally. That means I can increase or decrease the creep if I put energy into my system. The easiest way to put energy into a system using the experimental techniques available to me would be to load the system. So this is what we've done. We've developed a testing protocol here where we prepare a number of concrete samples, first of all, and then have these parallel tracks to our experimental campaign. In the first track here, we'll call this the creep test track, we simply apply a constant stress over time and observe this evolution of the strain, test the compressive strength after 28 days. In the next parallel track, called the uniform cyclic loading track, we do the same thing. We conduct a creep test, but we then interrupt it by one hour of constant amplitude cyclic loading. After the cyclic loading, we continue the creep test and run a compression test to see if there is an impact due to the uniform or the constant amplitude cyclic loading. Then we also have a parallel track where we do the same thing for random loading for one hour to test what the impact might be on the long-term behavior. And finally, we have companion shrinkage tests and samples to assess the impact of the environmental effects. The dynamic loading is conducted in a hydraulic a testing machine as shown here on the right. Now we've carefully selected our dynamic loading to avoid damage, so it's at 40% of the yield. And we only allow the amplitude, both for the constant amplitude and the random loading, to vary about plus or minus 5% of this load level. For the frequency, 
for the constant amplitude loading, we are loading at a frequency of 2 hertz. And for the random loading, we range between 1.25 and 5 hertz. What this test ends up looking like is almost a humming load applied dynamically to the system. Okay, so here are some of the results. Bear with me. We start here at the top left. All samples initially undergo a standard creep test. We see some fluctuations here. I've plotted it in linear scale as well as log scale. After the initial creep test, we subject it to either an hour of the uniform cyclic loading or the random loading. Then we conduct another creep test. And this is what we observe for all the uniform cyclic loading cases, you see one through three, that there is an acceleration of the creep beyond this horizontal line that represents the samples which were not exposed to any dynamic loading. However, for our random loading, we find that in fact, for some cases, we see a deceleration. So the response of the creep is below this line where we have no dynamic loading. So the interesting observations we can make here is that uniform amplitude cyclic excitations show a time acceleration of the long-term behavior. This agrees with previous publication by Bajant and Kim in 1992. But what has not been previously observed is the fact that short random excitations can reduce the creep in long-term deformations of the sample. If we take a look at our strength results, they initially look very uninteresting. There's only a slight variation in compressive strength, but the good thing is that this suggests that we did not induce damage. What we also see is that there's actually a slight increase in our strength due to the random loading. And I realize it's very slight, but notice pretty high confidence because we have plotted our bounds here for a very large set of tests. The other thing that we can track during our experiment is the di energy dissipation during dynamic loading, as well as the maximum rate of energy change. Relating this data to our creep data, we find that after dynamic load, creep will increase with increasing amount of energy I've put into the system up until a point, over a certain point of maximum change of energy that is put into the system. So the rate of change that I'm changing that energy suddenly I see a decelerate, decrease in the rate of the creep. Okay, so these experimental results or the responses that we see from these experimental results actually tend to agree with what existing analytical and numerical models are suggesting. In fact, that the configuration of our material is key uh, to describing the creep in long-term behavior. The observed phenomena could also be modeled, not on the, uh, uh, on the small scale, but on the continuum mechanics scale, as fatigue with random overloads that are acting on the flaws of our material. If we look at existing models of concrete, this type of behavior could also be adopted. For example, we could adjust a flow term in our rheological expression to include load history features that we might anticipate. For example, for a bridge, if we anticipate a certain frequency of loading, a certain frequency of overloads, this could be incorporated into our creep equation. The technique could also be used as a means to adjust the long-term performance of previously hardened concrete. And so in conclusion, I'd like to summarize two things. First of all, cracks do matter, especially for larger structures. The next question that I'd like to pursue is whether or not we can develop methods to estimate crack network statistics so that we could introduce these better into our performance predictions. The second point I'd like to make is that we can actually control creep through energy input, so we should be able to model creep with state equations. So the open question is, can we develop a mechanical and chemical Hamiltonian for random heterogeneous materials? If that's the case, then we'd use automated testing and machine learning setups to develop much more efficiently new concrete materials for various mechanical objectives. But this mathematical expression is what is missing for us. In fact, that's a challenge that um, is spanning across a number of disciplines, including geology for granular materials and all sorts of other um, 
uh, materials development that would like to use uh, machine learning techniques. If we could develop this type of uh, concept, the mechanical and chemical Hamiltonius or random heterogeneous material, then we could create microstructures that are in fact optimized for long-term performance. Okay, so thank you all for your attention. Here I've listed my collaborators, my advisor, uh, Professor Bijan, uh, uh, Professor Ron Wendner, uh, Professor Sideris, uh, uh, Jeff Bullard, and Edgar Boxy and my students, uh, Yigi Zhang and uh, Sandy Tukush, for helping me with our work. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Hebler, thank you for this very interesting overview of your work on a, a very interesting topic as well. So just like for the previous uh, medalist, I would first take some questions maybe from the audience and in the meantime I hope people online have had time to start typing in some questions. So any questions from the audience here? Yes, there is one. I'm Ravindra Getu. Thank you again for a very nice talk, Mia. Uh, I wanted to uh, discuss or uh, ask your opinion about two aspects that you touched upon. One is the cracking due to shrinkage and the aggregate effects. Now, as we are going to higher grades of concrete and water cement ratios are almost systematically less than 0.4, do you anticipate that the autogenous shrinkage of the cement paste will produce cracks around the aggregates? And is that something that we are uh, uh, studying or not yet? I think that's an excellent point. In fact, I'm always very concerned when I see these uh, water cement ratios as well as uh, um, added uh, cementitious materials because they tend to uh, drive uh, low and lower water cement ratios. And what I've actually observed is that what we end up seeing in the laboratory is cracks initiating at the center of our sample. Um, and those cracks are not uh, necessarily visible um, until you apply loading. And then suddenly, uh, based on whatever environment the sample has been cured in, you can almost get a catastrophic failure of your material. Um, and so uh, when we are working with these lower water cement ratio materials, it is even more important to control the curing environment because uh, those gradients that we see in, in the moisture um, and in mechanical properties, the differences in the thermal expansion coefficients suddenly um, are amplified. Um, and so I think that's something there isn't enough work on. And uh, people maybe, uh, it, it's, you can't see it from outside of your sample because the crack network might initiate from the center of the sample. And so people have not considered it as much. It would be great to study that with x-ray techniques. Have you seen any radial cracking from the aggregates, around the aggregates? When you look so, into your concrete, do you see any cracks starting from aggregates and radially propagating? I have not observed that. I assume that would be a case, the case for um, the, the types of materials you're describing. I've only studied cement behavior. So that's why I'm can't quite answer that, but I anticipate that would be the case because then not only is, is there issue of the diffusion, but there's also the mechanical mismatch. Um, and so we have uh, additional concerns there. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, maybe uh, Joaquin Barros, maybe a, a more practical application of this uh, model or this uh, topic. Well, you indicate that, that in fact it's very important to estimate the influence or to evaluate the crack surface internal of the concrete. Then when we try to, as a designer to estimate this, uh, we have, as you know, uh, ma mainly in practical applications, smear crack models or discrete crack models. But in fact, it is very difficult in reality when we apply for real case applications to estimate uh, the crack surface, crack weight. How do you think we can go in this direction? Oh, yes. So I think it's, I think right now crack modeling is too complicated to implement. 
And one of the things that I enjoy doing as an engineer is making approximations. And I think that's very important if we would want to, to do something like this into design. The reason, um, in part, why there are so many parameters, for example, in our existing creep and shrinkage prediction equations is because probably the crack network statistic is related to the water cement ratio. Probably the crack network statistic is related to the strength of the material. So we have all the information there. It's just not as directly related as possible. Um, and so I think we're missing a means to estimate or describe the statistics of our crack network. We describe the statistics of our strength of our material and we incorporate that into our size effects and whatnot, but we currently do not have a means um, to estimate the branching and the distribution, the scale of our cracking from our mixed design. And I think that, or our geometry of our structure. And I think that that is actually a lacking point. And it doesn't make sense to always build a very sophisticated model um, for every structure that we design. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions? For there, there's a few in on Slido. Okay. Maybe we can go to Slido. So that we have these ones. Okay. So, so there are a few questions related to the uh, interactions of cracks and creep. Studies of creep and crack healing, influence of cracks on drying creep, influence of temperature on creep, shrinkage and cracking. Mm -hmm. So that's all a little bit maybe related to the to the same uh, topic. So effect of uh, cracks on creep interactions with temperature do you do you see the does she see the questions as well yes. i see them yeah okay. maybe i'll start with the first one that's at the okay. top right now so um i am aware of studies of uh creep and uh crack healing um and so that is the closing of cracks uh due to the application of load um i think this um if we if we could uh, develop uh, the further the mechanical models for creep, this would naturally uh, enable us to incorporate uh, these kind of effects because just as much as uh, there's a configuration and distribution for material, there's also a crack distribution in our material. Um, and so if we included this crack distribution in our mechanics as, as we did in that the same problem, um, then this would be taken care of. Um, the other uh, way I'm aware of the healing of cracks is because I've worked um, extensively in bioengineered cements and in bioengineered cements, um, we're very actively trying to heal cracks. And um, we have to be very careful with the healing of cracks because recently there are many additives we can put in uh, cement or concrete to try and remediate cracking. But often what this does is it will accelerate the creep failure mechanisms. For example, if uh, the he healing of the crack is done with a material that isn't much softer than the damaged cement around it, then we can encourage further cracking much faster. And so we have to be very careful with our healing approaches. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Yeah, we will, it's also one of my topics, self-healing of materials. So maybe we'll have to <laughs> discuss this later in the future. Uh, and then effect of cracks on drying creep and effect of temperature on the creep. Okay, so um, elaborate more on the influence of cracks on the drying creep. Uh, well, so the cracks accelerate. Uh, uh, can, the cracks um, accelerate the drying processes. And uh, the drying creep is... Um, uh, as it said, is it's named is, is the creep that we see in relationship to the drying, and so it will accelerate these processes. Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to elaborate that on that at the moment, but um, I, I think there's a clear correlation. Too much because yeah, we are also having to move on with the uh, keynote lectures, and we are already like half an hour delayed due to the start. Okay. So maybe, but if you can just maybe very quickly on the last two questions, give a, a few words uh, of your opinion on that, like effect of temperature. Did you 
Is that effective temperature does appear in a number of existing prediction models. Generally, temperature um, accelerates the aging processes within the cement. And so as a result, um, what we see is a, a, a time acceleration of the, the creep or the shrinkage behaviors, or as you could say, a later time behavior. Um, okay, so then okay, thanks. last point. Sorry. There's one more, it seems. Yeah, the modeling of moisture transport in the okay, network due to drying independent of mechanical modeling as they have strong feedback so at the moment i have approached this problem twice once um ignoring the effect of the mechanics so the results i showed today is just the moisture diffusion and then we did the model again in a coupled sense um, introducing uh, more carefully the moisture movement using uh, isotherm information as well as the uh, the mechanics um, and uh, we see similar results uh, those results are still a bit in progress and so I wasn't ready to share those today but it doesn't affect the final conclusions so. okay okay thank you so much for your answer also to all these questions yeah, like I said, it's a pity that we cannot hand over the medal physically today, but uh, I hope maybe you will also be able to join us in Sheffield or at another occasion so that we can actually give you the medal, but I'm sure the RILAM presidency will be in contact with you about uh, those points. And um, yeah, for the audience present, um, well, I have to say that also the medalists, they have been invited to submit an article to RILAM Technical Letters. So you will also be able to read more about their work soon after this uh, paper is then uh, published. So thanks a lot. I wish you a very good uh, day. Congratulations again. And also thank you for getting up so early because <laughs> I realized that uh, probably you had to get up in the middle of the night <laughs> to be online to give this lecture. Yes. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.